What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barry, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young and bright assistant coach. And I, when I say young, and he's, he's, he's older, but I remember watching him as a high school kid uh, running around. Probably name had been big since he was sixth or seventh grade. So I was coaching high school basketball. I can remember that. Um, but he always had a basketball mind, basketball knowledge, uh, has a tremendous work ethic, a uh, great talent evaluator and recruiter, terrific teacher and a great skill development coach and he's a dmv native you know chris cole and and, and i'm gonna say a little bit about his bio um you know like he has a he has a history tremendous history um but like you know after an outstanding career you know over at national christian uh he goes to um and he's, you know he started off at montrose but then he went to national christian and finished up a great career playing for trevor brown there and uh, that's why i had the chance to see him a lot um, and then he went on to Hartford and he spent a year at Hartford. Uh, um, and then he goes to, you know, transfers to New Mexico state, um, and, uh, you know, for, for a couple of years and then uh, unfortunate turn, he ends up getting sick. Uh, he can't finish out his career and he ends up finishing his degree, you know, a few years later, uh, which is a compliment to him. Um, and, and, and then, and, you know, then he comes back home. Uh, he has a chance because he had done some things early and a lot of people respected him in the DMV area. And one of them was Curtis Malone, who, you know, a, a ton of people have a uh, tremendous respect for around here. And Chris was one of his guys that played for him, um, you know, on the AAU circuit. Um, he had a chance to come back home, work out some guys, some potential, you know, up and coming high school basketball stars who ended up. And I, I'll let him you know, talk about a little bit later about names. They had a chance to work out Nolan Smith with his pre-draft camp. Uh, which became, you know, he became a first round draft pick, uh, as well as um, Norris Cole, who ended up playing at Cleveland State, who got drafted. Uh, so he had a chance to work out some future pros for a couple of years. So he did a great job with skill, skill development. Um, and then he landed a job as the head coach of startup school at that at Rock Creek, Rock Creek Christian Academy in the, in, in the, in the DMV in uh, PG County, where he did a tremendous job of. Uh, not only coaching, but grooming these young men, um, you know, like his record speaks for itself, something, you know, we, we, we talked about it off air outside of that. Nothing had been done outside of the um, WCAC, except for Stu Vetter, which was legendary around here uh, in, in the DMV. Uh, Stu Vetter went on and had a great career and where he actually started high school at Montrose Christian was his last stop. And uh, from there, like I said, a tremendous five-year run, um, couple of championships, a couple of all Met guys, four and five years, which is uh, unbelievable. And then uh, he had a chance to go and coach in college. And where he's currently at, started in 2018 at Bryant University. He's an assistant coach and just finished up his third year. And they actually was playing in the championship game this year to go to the NCAA tournament. So they had a chance to, to win the league and uh, they fell short of getting to the NCAA tournament. But that turnaround has been tremendous uh, for his first three years uh, up in uh, – Brian, I want to welcome to the show. You know, I'm going to say it one time because he's an adult now. Um, <laughs> you know, we've always known him. He was, he was, uh, you know, his Chris Cole is his name. But we always called him Fat Cat. That was something he'd learned. People didn't realize he, at his size how, you know, he was, he was crafty, very skilled. But I want to welcome to the show, Chris, man. How you doing? Appreciate it, man. I, I'm honored to be on. I, I appreciate you having me on and I've been watching the series and it's a lot of great stuff, a lot of genuine stuff. So I'm ready to get into it, man. Appreciate you having me. Yes, sir. So you know what, man? We'll get right into it. We're gonna get unmasked, man. So uh and I thank you for those for those kind of words. Um, you know, Chris, like you came out of high school, and a lot of times that's one of the biggest things, like, you know, isn't an adjustment when you first you, you are a head high school coach, not an assistant, right. but a head high school coach. And now you go into college, at least you were familiar with, um, you were familiar a little bit with, you, with the guy you worked for, and Jared Grosso, and he was at Hartford. 
right. I think it was it was right when you were coming in and he was leaving out, or vice versa. So um, there's no handbook to being a college coach. There's not. No one gives you a book and said this is how it's done. You were involved with it. You knew about it a little bit because you were you had players that were going to college. But like, tell me about the first day, first week, first month, after things are done with human resources, especially when no one gives you direction. Like, yeah. tell me, like, that, what's that about? Because you kind of thrown into the fire. Yeah, you are. You you're absolutely thrown into the fire. And me being a high school coach, it, people think it would be a easy transition, but I was used to being in control of everything, and I was the one kind of delegating responsibilities and stuff like that. So it was kind of a total flip for me. Um, I tell the story a, a lot. I actually um, drove down. So my first week I drove down and got um, to campus maybe four or five in the morning. And I had to interview like at eight o'clock. So I'm like, my, my stuff is wrinkled. I got to uh, iron my stuff, do, do, do the interview. Uh, Coach, Coach Grosso, Jared had already hired me in his mind, but you know, you got to go through the, the ADs interviews and stuff like that. So I ended up doing that in um, my first week. So I work out some guys. We're like my first day or second day, first or second day. I work out some guys and my first day I get hit with a Charlie horse. And I'm talking about my leg is like, like it's huge right at night and I go to sleep and it's overnight and we got weights at six o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, man, I can't even walk like the whole night. I'm trying to loosen it up, do this, do that. Uh, I get up, I take a picture of my thing and send it to coach and everybody know coach is a, a workhorse. And I'm like, coach, man, my, my thing killing me. He don't send me anything back, <laughs> nothing back. I'm like, man, it's like 10 minutes before we supposed to be, the kids are supposed to be there. He, he ain't send me nothing back. I'm like, man, I got to figure out how to suck this up. So I wrap myself, suck it up, end up working out, man. But that's just uh, kind of my introduction to college coaching or anything like that. You know, it, we, we work around here and, and he wasn't, he, he wasn't trying to give any leeway on that. <laughs> I, I feel it. I mean, you're right. It, it's you, like you said, you work, uh, he's always been a grinder, so he expects yeah. his staff to be the same way, yeah. and he's not going to let up. That's that's an interesting story right there. And he like, wasn't he wasn't even mean, disrespectful. He just didn't say anything. <laughs> that's that's how they are. And, and, and you know what? You understood too. Like I'm about to get there. I, I'm about to make sure I'm there. Yeah. Um, recruited. We all know that's the lifeline of college athletics, and you know, even though you you know you, you didn't you didn't have to re recruit, you do kind of because it's private school, right. everybody knows how the DMV is from recruiting. Um, you know, like you want to get good kids, you want to be good. You have to get good players around here. But now you go to college and, you know, we, like I said, it's the lifeline of college athletics. You have to get good players. You have to get good people. And then you want to get good students. That, yeah. And they don't always have to be an A student or sometimes a B student, but it got to be someone that cares. And so you want to have someone who, values trying to get a degree those are the guys and if you get those three together uh it makes a great combination it makes it easier for those guys to be successful and it makes your job a lot easier too for sure what what was your best and worst recruiting story in these first three years that you've been at brian like what like what do you sit back and say wow that was great i did you know we did a great job we as a staff did a great job of landing that kid or Man, I did this, and I can't believe this kid didn't come here at the end of the day. Anything that jumps out to you, jumps out of your mind? Well, my best story is one of the kids that's a staple of our program now, uh, Charles Pride, and it was kind of my. Um, it was actually hand in hand, uh, my my worst and my best. So um, I'll give you the best. Um, Charles Pride, like I said, is one of the staples of our program. So we got him on the visit, and you know, I took him around and. Brock Erickson, who, who uh, is at UIC at the time, was kind of leading the, the charge. Him and Te uh, Telly, Phil Martelli Jr., who's our associate head now, were kind of leading the charge. So I was just doing the day-to-day -day activities. And um, Charles Pride hadn't made his uh, decision yet. Um, and we're we're on the last day. He's up putting them science. It's nothing but a 45 minutes job. We got his family down there and everything. And uh, so we're just sitting 
in the room and coach is like, uh, you know, you ready to make a decision. And Charles is like, uh, not really. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go through all the needless to say, but we were in that room for about three more hours, three and a half more hours, I'm not, not even joking. And, you know, coach, coach kept giving him chance and chance to, to make his decision. And if he didn't, wasn't ready, we were gonna wait for his decision. And, um, you know, coach is one of the best recruiters in the country, in the country, uh, going back to his days at Iona. And needless to say, Charles Pride is on our team and he made eight threes in the championship game the other, uh, <laughs> the other day. So that's one of my best stories. Um, one of my worst, uh, and I, I don't want to say worst, but it's just a learning experience. Um, I had one of a kid that I played that played for me at um, uh, Rock Creek, Clinton Christian, and I was recruiting him, and it was done, like it was done. Um, but you know, he needed to make a decision soon, and if the decision wasn't made, we were going to go in a different direction. So you know, some of these kids think this this recruiting thing, they, they don't really have a feel for this recruiting thing. Like it's also a business. Yeah. I love you, but if you're not ready and somebody else is, you can even be a little better than that kid. But you know, I mean, it, it's just part of the business. So he wanted to go home and talk to his family and this, that, and it was done. Like, I know this kid, I know the family, I know this thing was done, but he wanted to go through that another three day process coach wasn't trying to go through a three-day process. So before that third day was up, we had another kid uh, that fit our mold and we wanted him and we brought him in and I lost out on that recruit, but we as a team ended up getting uh, one of the guys we wanted. So it worked out, but it was a learning experience for me of the things I need to do and the information I need to have before we even go into um, the visit and stuff like that to be able to get it done in a timely fashion. And, and that's what it's about. Like you learn as you go in this business. And like you say, like, I mean, I've been in your situation where, you know, a kid I coached and you think it's done. And, yeah. and like, you know, like they, they, it's almost like, yo, man, I know you, I'm, I'm you know, like, no, no, let's do this. And, and, and it sounds like you guys have a formula, have a plan and you understand like at your level, if you got kids that are really good and they, and you get them on campus, you almost have to get them to say yes while they're there. Yep. Because if they go home, it's kind of like if anybody at a higher, even a higher level gets in their yep. ear, they're going to, oh, man, this is where I'm going. Instead of coming to the right place, knowing right. it's the right place right then and there. So I actually love what y'all are doing. I'm, I'm listening to you yeah. that you guys, like, once they're on campus, we about to get them done. Because yeah. if they leave, we're probably not going to get them. And it sounds like a successful formula thus far. Yeah. I keep saying, I keep saying these commitments and stuff to Brian. So y'all doing a great job with that. Sure, trust sure. me. <laughs> um, now you, this is something different. Like you, you away from home. Cause trust me, I lived up in Providence. I mean, yeah. I've, I've moved from, you know, the DC area when I was in Jersey to Providence, Rhode Island. So I can tell you, you over in Smithfield. And, right. And so it's right there together. But um, what did you have to sacrifice um achieving your current level of success i don't usually say give up but i'm like what did you have to sacrifice to achieve your current level of success no i mean your your um the podcast unmasked is about helping people out so i'm gonna definitely be genuine because i want people to understand what they're getting into and you know really learn from each and every person that's on this podcast so me me personally I definitely had to, you know, I sacrificed some relationships and some I did uh, on purpose and some, you know, just for my work ethic and wanting to be good and striving to be excellence, I kind of hindered myself. Um, so you got to know what you're getting into in this college basketball. It's very time consuming. And if you want to be good at it, uh, it's definitely time consuming. So I definitely had to pick and choose um the timing of my life and stuff that I wanted to kind of accomplish and get through and, and stuff that I didn't want to sacrifice at the time. Uh, two, two different instances. As a high school coach, I had several opportunities right away because I had success right away. And 
I had to choose between was I going to leave this kid who I know doesn't have a, a family background, doesn't have necessarily the, the mental tools or anything to be able to do this by himself without somebody like myself being there on a day to day. So I actually passed up a couple of job opportunities in order because I knew this kid is a sophomore. He's not going to make it if I don't stay here until he's a senior. This kid is a freshman. This kid is a junior. Da 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 da. So what I ended up doing is um, when I knew I was on my way out, I tried to make sure that all my kids were seniors and I only left two kids. There was one kid that was a freshman and one kid that was a junior. I ended up helping uh, that one kid that was a junior be able to get into school. And the one kid that was a freshman is actually um, graduating this year. And um, he ended up being able to get into school and all that. So I had to pick and choose the opportunities that I took based on my moral and what, what I wanted to do with my life. And you know, one of the things I, that's very important to me is helping raise young men and teaching them how to be young men and also getting them to the next aspect of their life. Now, going forward, the second part is the relationship part. You know, I've, I've lost out on some, you know, romantic relationships or what else because of the time and effort I put into there, which I, I don't necessarily agree with you. Like you live and learn, you got to find a balance. But me being young and trying to do this thing uh, to the best of my ability, I definitely took more time into that than I did into other instances in my life. Um, and it definitely hindered that uh, from being able to, to expand or get better. So I've learned um, as a man, a little bit more balance and a little, well, we talk about it in, the, the, in our workplace a lot. We laugh about it. We always call it, it's a uh, work-life balance. We gotta have that. <laughs> we gotta have a little bit of that. So early on, I was really bad on it and it, it hindered some of um, my relationships, but uh, now I've gotten a little better. And that's what this is about, just getting better and watching guys. And, you know, I see Jared with his kids and his wife and the time he spends with both. And I see Phil Martelli Jr. doing the same thing. Uh, and you're able to learn not just the that aspect of, you know, coming in and a scouting reporter or that, but you're able to learn how to get through this business and also, you know, do the things that you really want to do in life. That's awesome stuff. I, I, you do a lot of things in that learning, which is key. This is what this is about. Like you're teaching some of these young guys. And I mean, what I didn't say earlier was you were 26 when you got your first head job. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you were, even though you weren't, you were a grown man, you was an adult, but you were still young enough. Like, and that doesn't happen to everyone that you got a head job at 26 years old. Don't right. matter what level that is. And I, and I thought that was, that's something tremendous. And like you said, you handled that the right way. And, Timing was perfect for you. You made the right decision, timing, when to go into college. Yeah. Um, I thought all those things were awesome, man. Um, scout reports. That's another thing that's huge at this level. Um, you know, you know, like we 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 as as coaches and you as you get into it, and you probably you have been doing it, you know, even before you got to college, but you know, at the college level, it's a, it's, man, there's a lot more work. Like you watch seven, eight games, yeah, yeah. you know, like you like you like everything that you pour into it because it becomes that's a competitive thing like everybody's competitive yeah. <laughs> but you want to make sure that you're putting your kids in the best position to be successful gotcha. um you want to make sure you're giving them as much information as you can you can't overload these kids because if you give them too much they, they're gonna just tune out you got to give them just enough um so that they they can you know retain it and understand it and then like you always do this as well, Chris. Like, you know, you come up and you you know that the kid, uh, uh, person is struggling from shooting, and you like, yeah, coach. You know, the kid is like two for his last thirty from three, and then all of a sudden, you know, coach, you told him struggling. All he heard was he was a bad shoot. He heard two for thirty. You never said that. And then he makes two in a row. You know, I'm sure Coach Grasso is turning around looking at you like, I thought he was a bad shooter. No, coach, I never said that. Or oh, your players are looking at you like. Yo, coach, you said he couldn't shoot, but talk about your best and worst scout reports you may have had. And it's not always anything in particular, but something you like, man, I wish I'd have done this or done th did this a little better. Talk about that, your best and worst scout reports. So 
some of my best, you know, I don't know if I've had, I, I definitely remember my worst, <laughs> um, but I, some of the best, I, I don't necessarily know if they were the best, but I got an opportunity my first year uh, straight out of high school to do our Iowa um, scouting report. And we were, that was my very first scouting report. And we were actually tied with them with a minute to go. Um, O'Brien University, who was three and 23 the year before, three and 28, I think the year before they go into Iowa at Iowa and we're, we're tied with them with a minute to go, ended up losing that game by five. But um, that was one of my um, good moments to have as scout report. And the following year I did Maryland, um, you know, and we had a good showing against Maryland. So I was at that game. Ah, yeah. I remember that. I, I, I would like to talk about how angry you was after the game on that one, but we're, we're talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, Maryland and then the, this past year, I forgot who was our big, uh, big school. I, I ended up doing Syracuse. So a lot of those big games I took pride in and being able to, you know, do a good job on the scouting report. And we've been right there of knocking off a mid-major. I mean, not a mid-major, I'm sorry. Knocking off a high major. I mean, we had Syracuse uh, down 17, 18 and ended up losing by one. So th those are some of my favorite ones. Um, but my, my worst one, man, was my first year. And I'm thinking I'm doing a good job. Like, I, I, man, I'm, when I tell you I'm watching film, I'm watching film galore. I got everything known to man in my head, right? In my head, I've got, and this is kind of a good thing of having Jared Grosso as your coach, but then you also got to be accountable. So my accountable portion is um, I ended up, I, I have everything in my paper. And he was like, you got any play calls? Or play calls? You talking about, what are you talking about play calls? <laughs> He's like, yeah, like when they when they call the play, like what's the name of the play? What's the signal? What's everything? I'm like, and me, I'm a I'm an honest dude. I ain't gonna fake you. Like, I just come like if I make a mistake, I'm gonna tell you. I'm like, coach, I ain't gonna play calls. And he looks at me and just turns around and keeps doing his thing. So I know. I know from there on out, you know, you better have some play calls or you better um, make sure that you're up to date to what they're doing. Um, the, the good part is what you kind of mentioned earlier, though, like coach doesn't really like if I say a dude was a, a capable shooter or this, that and a third and he nailed three. Gross is so hands on with his stuff. He's also done the research. So he doesn't turn around and look at you like you told me he was a bad shooter because he's also done the research. And, you know, I'll give him the tendencies ahead of time and he'll look at the tendencies and he'll go from there. So, you know, he's a workaholic too. So he knows exactly what we're looking at and um, what we see and stuff like that. So, uh, and then on top of that, you know, I'm learning from you. You've worked with uh, Phil Martelli Jr. So, you know, he's one of the best in the business at at the scout. So I just continue to learn from him and watch him and kind of add my own taste and how I want to do it. But uh, I got two of the best right there. Yeah, yes, you do. And then you mentioned Brock earlier. He was a guy like could yeah. teach you some stuff, some other things. So like you yeah. were working with some good guys, like you've been around some good guys at a young age. Everybody don't get that opportunity, but you've been around some really good guys. And Phil is, Phil is very thorough. He's definitely into that. Like you was talking about with the scout. So you better uh, not Better not mess with his edit tape. <laughs> um, biggest challenge, man, you think you've experienced since you've become a college coach? What's, what do you think the biggest challenge has been? Uh, I'll go back to being a high school coach and being hands-on and being the one to delegate stuff and, and really kind of being the leader of the pack. I've had to, and it's actually made me a better leader, but I've had to learn how to follow because all – through my adult life, like, like you said, you went back, I graduated college. And then, you know, after me getting sick and uh, overcoming my sickness and stuff, I went right into training and owning my own business. So I owned my own business. And then I went from owning my own business to being the head coach. So I was the guy in charge. And then you jump into the assistant. So you want to do a good job, not necessarily, I wouldn't say stepping on anybody's toes, but you want to do a good job in your role and being an expert in your role, but also being a team player and knowing when or when not to take the leadership role. So I think that was hard at first because, you know, there's some input I, I felt like 
I may have wanted to give, but it wasn't my time. Um, and I've had to learn how to do that as well as be a good teammate. The good thing, I'm working for a boss who wants guys to be head coaches one day. So he treats you like head coaches, whether it's the scout or whether he's telling you to take over the defense or whatever it is. So I can kind of do that. But going in, you still, even though he gives you that freedom, you don't know if it's the right thing or not. You know, so I had to learn that my first year, when to be able to take charge, when not. And I think I've done a, um, a, a, a lot better job from my first year to my third year, even from first to second, second to third. But it's just a learning process, man. And I just, you know, I definitely, and coach always says work, you know, we're working with him, but you're, you're also working for your boss. So you want to, you, you want to make sure that whatever you're articulating uh, goes into his ear the way he can kind of articulate it back to uh, this, the student athletes and all of that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm, 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 I'm learning some stuff from you right now. Um, do you ever find that there are things about you that people misunderstand? Like, you know, like, it's just, I mean, it, it, it's a short time. You, you know, like, you know, what are they, if you think, like, he's like, man, you know, some people, they don't have no idea anything about me, but they just misunderstand you. Anything? Yeah. It's funny you ask that, because I'm going to give you a story. First, first I'm going to answer the question, then I'll give you a story. So, um, the, the thing I think people, you know, don't really get of me is, like, when they see me as my demeanor. Um, cause I'm, I'm a little laid back and, and calm and everything. But when I was a player, it was the total opposite. Like you see me as a player, it was the total opposite. So I actually, you know, just through net networking and stuff and talking to people, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I was talking on the phone with a, a well, now, now a friend, I didn't know him before, but now a friend in the biz business who's pretty successful. And he was like, man. I only knew you as a player and I thought you were like this rough, tough, like, just like <laughs> now I hear you on here and articulating yourself and this, that, and the third. And I think people that know me as a player, because it's not that far removed, kind of don't know how my demeanor is and how I can articulate to kids and um, how I actually respond and, and kind of deal with kids on a day-to-day -day basis and don't know what I'm really about. So, um, I'm glad, you know, we have this network and stuff like this to be able to show people that and, and talk like that. But that that's one thing I think people are surprised about is my demeanor kind of outside of competition. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that, that would yeah, that would be something you, you're right about that. I'm just like I'm listening. And um, like I said, I've been I've been knowing you. So I know yeah. I've seen off and on the court. So that's a good thing. Like you, you talked about a little bit earlier, we're all educators in this business. Right. Like, what do you try to teach your players besides basketball? Uh, and one thing I always say it, it, uh, to them is, I want to teach you how to win. Like, and that's not necessarily on the basketball court. Um, there's things that go on in life. And I think one of my biggest strengths is being genuine. So I'm able to relate to any type of demographic. Um, and one thing I try to teach them is no matter what's going on in life, um, there's bad calls in the game. You're going to quit and not try to win the game, you know, whether it's sexism, whether it's racism. And that's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with in this world right now. Um, any type of ism or you're not being treated right. You got to figure out how to win. And one of the things um, that can help people win and that's helped me in my life is just being a genuine individual and doing the right things, you know doing the right things and treating people right. Uh, I think I've had tremendous success, not because I'm this big time um, brainiac with this basketball thing, but I think I've been able, since I was a kid, to treat people right and respect people. And so people want to help, you know? So when I was sick and I was in a rut, Curtis Malone thought about me because, hey, there's this great kid, such and such, such and such. Trevor Brown, who's damn near like my godfather, thought about me you know, Chris Pompey, Larry Harrison, they thought about me as a person first because they remembered that. Jared Grosso, you know, even though we had contact through my high school years, he knew me as a person before anything else. So 
one thing I try to teach them, man, is, is how, how to win, man, how to get through sticky situations, how to handle adversity um, with class and dignity and, and be able to treat people the right way. That's a powerful, powerful statement right there. And it's interesting, you, you threw out some names. Um, you know, Larry Harrison was a guest on the show, still trying to get Pompey on, yeah. saying I'm coming. So he's the one I'm still trying to get on. Um, and, uh, you know, like you say, I, can remember, I can remember, it's funny you say that because everything you just said, as much as you were a kill on the court, you still had the biggest smile. Might have been a sneaky yeah. grin. <laughs> but like you, you had one of those. So I, that was something I always respected about you. Like, you know, you could be one person on the floor and then off the floor, you were somebody totally different. And like you said, that's, you were a great person mm -hmm. and that's why great things happen, happen to you. And they, and, and people always want to be around, want to be around great people. So that's definitely a compliment uh, of, you know, your upbringing and, and, and things of that nature. Um, what are your best, and I know what you're gonna say, because what's your best and worst memories in coach? I know this year was a heartbreak for this championship game, especially with all the work you had. But what what's, what are your best and worst memories in coach? Man, you know what? One of my and I, I can't mention um, a, a lot by names, just you know NCAA rules. But one of my greatest um, things that happened is I. I when I very first started um, skill development stuff, I, I had these seventh graders who I didn't even think about coaching in high school or anything like that. I had um, two seventh graders that I, I just worked out and they weren't the best. They weren't one of these um, brand name AAU teams. They just really wanted to get better. You know what I'm saying? So I worked with them all the seventh grade, all the seventh grade. And then their eighth grade year, um, they ended up being able to, um, they got a little better. And then I ended up being able to get the coaching job at Clinton Christian slash Rock Creek. Um, so they joined me as an eighth grade, uh, a first year coach as eighth graders. Um, that following year, uh, I also got another kid who didn't have a terrific uh, upbringing and um, needed some help. Uh, wasn't really good at basketball or anything, but just really needed some help. And tried to see if we can get him into school and better his life from where he was at, at the time. Um, that senior night, man, uh, four years later, which ended up being my fifth year, uh, four years later was one of the best things that's ever happened to me in college basketball. Cause I seen those kids grow from literally middle schoolers to young men who were going into college and on scholarships and being able to become the men that they are. I wish I could say their names, but they, uh, you know, you can't, but it was one of my greatest things to be able to help see those guys from their adversity, whether it's some typical family stuff, like I don't agree with my sister and my mother's getting on my nerves, or, um, their relationships with females and just school stuff and help them get through all of that. And I was able to do that for five years with somebody who I was not somebody, those three kids who I was really invested, not just basketball wise, but with their family and everything. So that was one of my best, sorry to be long winded, but that was one of my um, best, like absolute best uh, stories from a, a coaching perspective. And then my worst would probably, I wouldn't even say it's worse, man. Um, Cause I, I, I handle adversity a little better than I did as a kid, <laughs> but this year you hit it right on the nose, man. We, we put in a ton of work and we got the program going from three and 28 to the championship game. And then we get to the semifinal games and we get hit by COVID. So we get hit by COVID. We only got six scholarship kids and we ended up winning our semifinal game by 30. And then we have a, a thing like the kids can come back and they can play. So they ended up coming back and playing and they didn't play to the best of their ability, but you can't fault them. They were in quarantine for 12 days before, before they spent one day out of quarantine before a championship game. And they ended up not shooting the ball as well as they typically do. And we lost the game by five um, and shout out to Mount St. Mary's. They really, really played a terrific game uh, against us, but we definitely, you know, got hit and we're looking forward to next year for sure. <laughs> I'm sure y'all are because I know y'all back at, trust me, I'll figure that. I know that. Um, 
Uh, and I like to ask this because this was if you want to talk about it, it's up to you. Like, what was the most stressful situation you have faced? Oh, for sure. When I, um, yeah, I'll try not to be that long winded, but when I got sick uh, out of college uh, and I had to stop playing. So I transferred from Hartford uh, to New Mexico State, sat out, got my body in shape and everything. And then the year I was supposed to play, um, I played that entire year. Uh, sick you know I had cancerous polyps in me and that's something my father passed away from when I was young when I was 13 so it was a scary situation I ended up um, having to stop playing and then a year after that I had to um, take the whole year to kind of get myself together and, and recover from everything and I ended up being homeless at some point for a little bit and trying to figure that out um, so that was definitely the most stressful thing and thankful guys like Trevor Brown and Curtis Malone rang my, you know, rang my phone and checked up on me and ended up having me be able to do what I did and get into some skill development stuff. And I tell people all the time, man, uh, you got to learn how to handle adversity, man. So that time of me being sick uh, helped me learn how to handle adversity and how to handle things that don't really go your way. So, um, I'll tell a quick story. When I was doing skill development, like I said, I was I was a big time name out here uh, when I first came back doing skill development. Like I did Norris's stuff. I'm in there with Dante Cunningham. I got Nate Britt in there. Nate Britt goes from George Mason, North Carolina. I got Melo Trimble. I got Roddy Peters. I got all these kids in here and people have no clue that I'm dead broke. <laughs> and I'm talking dead broke. I'm going from... Um, uh, met, metro station down to uh, Benham, Benham Road, Metro Station walking down to Benham Road. Malcolm Battle at the time let me use his gym. So one thing I had to do, and people laugh at it when I tell the story, one thing I had to do is I had to get there an hour ahead of time before I worked anybody out. So they wouldn't know that I'm walking in the same shoes that I'm working you out in. You know what I mean? And then my last client, so if I got Norris Cole as my last client, I would stay an extra hour so that they didn't know that I wasn't driving, that I was walking in those same shoes and the same outfit back to Benham Road, Metro, and all the way back home. Um, so those are the kind of the toughest things I had to deal with at the time, man, and, and trying to get through those things. And I was able to get through there and become a high school coach and then kind of do what I've been doing now. But th at those times of me being sick and having to learn those lessons and getting through a little bit of adversity or a lot of bit of adversity um, was, was imperative to my growth right now. Wow, man, that, that's, 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 I'm glad you shared that. Like you said, like you grew up fast, like, yeah. you know, so your father passed away at 13. So you had already started, you know, dealing with adversity and things of that nature. So it made you strong. And I'm gonna say this too, like shout out Malcolm Battle, I have to do that. Man, when he was shout out of his battle. And you were and you were brave because do you know you you always shout bears and then you walk in the Bennett Road Metro, that neighborhood over there where, where Chavez is, I mean <laughs> that's the neighborhood over there either. You know what I'm saying? I'm so, walking with the cash that they done gave these kids done gave me to work them out. I'm I'm hauling them Bennett Road. I'm hauling to the metro. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, I, I give you credit for that one. Wow, that, that's that's some brave stuff right there. Um, what's the strangest thing that you've been in it for a little while now, and you you definitely on the high school side? But what is the strangest thing? And you don't have to name names because we don't. I, I don't like like sometimes people may do it, but they don't. What is the strangest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court? You just like wow, I can't believe this kid even did that. It could be strange, weird. Like, what's the strangest thing you may have seen? First of all, one of my uh, things that I'm good at, and, and Coach Grosso lets me handle a lot of stuff, is being able to handle all type of stuff. So I'm not at liberty to say everything, but I'll give you um, some high school stuff. <laughs> some high school stuff that, that um, I would say I got to pick and choose my, my thing. So... <laughs> one day I was, like I said, I was, I, 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 I was probably a little closer to my kids than the average high school coach. So I ended up coming to school one day 
and one of the kids was not uh, at, you know, at school. So I know where to find them and stuff. So I end up going to this person's house and, <laughs> and I, ended, I ended up finding them and a young lady in the house together. So <laughs> they were in a position at the time where there was nothing, there was nothing left to the imagination, but the kid ended up telling me that they were studying for their test at one o'clock. So <laughs> I had to figure, I had to try to explain to him that they weren't, they did not have the class that they were practicing at the time. <laughs> They, that class was not on neither of their transcript at all, I promise you. <laughs> so I'm not naming names or anything, but that that's that's one of the um, craziest little stories I, I had. No anatomy at Clinton Christmas slash Rock no, Creek? Come on, no, man. No, 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 no anatomy. <laughs> and I know right, right, right where to go. Like, I know right where to go. As soon as I don't see him, I know where to go. <laughs> you sure you didn't have – that sound like a – I'm throwing two names out here. That sound like uh, Earl Risby slash Toe over there. Like you knew where to find those guys back in the day. <laughs> For you sure. know, you ride because you know, yeah. you know how it is. Yeah. You know how it is. For sure. But, you know, people don't get, they, they won't know. They won't, some people won't know who those guys are, but trust me, yeah. me, me, me and Chris, Chris know who those guys are. Um, yeah. Some of the two, two of the better basketball players in the DC area that's ever come through here. A lot of people don't care about them, you know, from a national standpoint. Some bad boys, brothers. Bad yes, boys. they were. Yes, they were. I always say that Toe may have been the best, one of the best eighth graders I've ever seen. Like, yeah. I don't think people realize that. You know, no one could defend like him at that time. I remember Ooh, that. So, he used to yeah. stretch his arms out. Do stretch his arms out. Woo. Yeah. Um, I, I like to ask this question because you, you are a historian. You are a throwback guy. Um, if you had a chance to sit down with, you know, four guys, um, it didn't matter what level of coaching, just to pick their brain, past or present, um, who would you want to sit down with, talk to, just figure out what did they do to get to where they, you know, what, what did they do that got to them being successful? Like, who are four guys you would like, I would love to sit down, talk with, spend, eat, you know, grab lunch or dinner with them and just talk hoops talk life who would that be um i think one one of the um ones that comes to mind right off the bat because i'm, I'm starting to read his book is john thompson for sure uh john thompson is definitely a, a guy i would love to sit down and have a adult conversation with um unfortunately i was a kid uh when i was around john so his choice of words towards me as i was um <laughs> gaining weight weren't, weren't <laughs> uh, something that I, I, I would actually, well, I, to be honest, I did learn from it, so I can't say that. But um, I would love to have an adult conversation with him. Uh, piggyback off of his book, Dean Smith, would be somebody I would love to have a conversation with uh, to see how he was able to get to where he was, one, but also be able to, um, you know, deal with personalities and stuff like that. Um, I think a third one would be Chuck Daly as a coach. Cause we're, we're just talking coaches, right? Chuck Daly, Chuck Daly, for sure. Uh, I admired him from afar. Um, and as a young, and as I was studying the game and learning about the game. And then the fourth one, uh, you know, somebody like, I, I would say somebody young, like maybe a, a Ty Lu or somebody like that, somebody young, you know, that's able to command the room and, and has some of the same personality traits that I believe I have. Um, yeah, somebody like that. That's just off the top of my head. I'm sure I could get a little deeper if I thought about it, but right off the top of my head, I think those guys would be uh, some guys to really. I like those four, man. I think those are four interesting. They were different. You know, they all were different people, but it's something you can learn from them in different ways. And they all are successful guys. I, I actually like that. Um, no, add a fifth one, Hubie Brown. Oh man, I would love to. I would love to sit down and just have an hour, two hour conversation with Hubie Brown. I, I forgot him for sure. I'm gonna tell you, I was fortunate to sit down with Larry Brown and spend three, four hours with him. Like that, like that would be 
you that that's another basketball mind. If you enjoy Hubie, you would enjoy Larry Brown as well. Trust me. Um, I, I asked this question. This is a little different. It's more entertaining. Like, what movie or TV show title best describes your week? Like, whenever like you're in a week, what movie or TV show title best describes your week? Whew, movie, movie, movie. Whew. That always get people because they like. Yeah, movies. it's got to be. Favorite gotta movie be is. <laughs> yeah, because I don't. I don't know too many movies, but it has to be something. You know what? Training Day. There we go. <laughs> Training, Training Day. That's a good one. That's good. every day you're like learning. Every day is like you're training for the next day. So in all aspects, I'm talking, you know, you talked about scouting reports. You talk about working out. You talk about uh, on the board. You talk about everything. Every day is training for something else. So Training Day could be a good one. I like that. I definitely like that. What's your favorite word or phrase that you like to use? I'm going to go a little bit more um, entertaining with this one. Some of our kids like it. So I would say either, hey, Cash, or hey, Auntie. When we do our drills and stuff, um, if guys are hitting, I'll just yell out, hey, Cash. And I say it a lot during our pregame stuff when we're warming up. So the, the guys get a kick out of that. I either say, hey, Cash or hey auntie, and we have our own little uh, meaning behind those things. But uh, I, I would say that, that those are my phrases. Awesome, awesome. I, 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 I'm glad, I'm glad you, you said you have, y'all have your own little meanings. I, I like that. Um, I, I'm not even gonna imagine what they are, but hey. <laughs> um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, it's so many, man. It's so many. I would say be yourself, you know, but that goes with also being genuine. And, and I would say any advice I would give on top of that is learn every single day from every person and everything that you have contact with. Like Ardobo, I learned from Ardobo. Every day, I learn um, from maybe our third assistant. Every day, I learn from our volunteer. Every day, and then I also, of course, learn from a Philip Martelli and um, Jared Grasso. And I'm not, you know, out about it, but I learn something every day, and I take it home and I ponder on it and I learn. But also, man, whenever you're in a situation, and especially new situations, you're trying to figure out how to fit in and do this and do that. But make sure you're always being yourself and true to yourself with your morals and your work. Um, make sure that whatever your great traits are, that those things show and whatever you need to work on, that you work on that. But don't be scared to make a mistake. Don't be scared to make a mistake, be yourself. Awesome, Pow powerful words. You've never been a self-promoter. Like I said, I've watched you since you were, woo, man, I'm, I'm old, I'm telling on myself. Um, <laughs> Cause I was at Oxen Hill from 97.03, so yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm just saying, wow. Um, if you, like I said, you never was a self promoter. You know, you don't go around and talking about yourself. You let your work speak for itself. Um, if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, like which which would you choose? What three would you choose? Uh, I would definitely start with genuine. Um, I would de definitely start with genuine. Um, caring kind of goes into genuine, so. Uh, I got to use a different one. Uh, hardworking, for sure. Um, and versatile. versatile. Those are three good ones. Those are three really good ones. Yeah. I, I like that. And I'm going to ask you this. This is going to be tough because you mentioned several names. And so if you do want to mention several names, that's not a problem. But, like, what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Um. Well, easy answer, my father. He's, he's the one that kind of uh, built me to the man I am. And I, I mean, he gave me the tools up until I was 13 to be able to get through some of the stuff that I, I got through and taught me how to treat people and everything like that. So definitely my father. Um, uh, the event that changed my life was the most was definitely getting sick and getting through that. Uh, 
that that definitely changed my life, who I was and my perspective on life. Um, but uh, if you want to dig a little deeper uh, for my career and people I learned from and stuff like that, um, there's definitely three or four guys. Uh, I got to make sure I shout out Trevor Brown, who when I was struggling with my father's death and everything um, as a kid, uh, I ended up going from Montrose to there. And he, he definitely helped me out um, more than basketball, you know, be able to get to where I was. Chris Pompey, who ended up knowing he knew my father at the time, uh, never gave up with uh, on me, um, whether it was um, before I went to college or even after I was sick in college. And then more um, Curtis Malone. Curtis Malone was the one that gave me gave me the shot. And I tell people all the time um, when we talk about Kurt and, you know, he he served whatever he did. You know what I mean? When we're not condoning that. Um, but he he's a great man because everybody looks at the Mike Beasley's and the DeMar Johnson's and this, that. When I was sick, he didn't have to call um, Chris Cole. He didn't have to call Fat Cat. He didn't have to give Fat Cat a chance. He didn't have to do any of that because I could. he couldn't get anything off of me at the time. You know, there's nothing in it for him except for to help me better my life. So Curtis Malone, um, David Atkins, who's uh, at the Wizards right now, he was the, the one that tried to keep me in line at Montrose when I was a complete knucklehead and never gave up with uh, on me after I gave it. And then the last one, man, I think he's one of the greatest uh, people in the business is Larry Harrison. And I know you had him on the show. People have no clue. And I do want to shout this out. I'm, people probably be mad that I said this, though. He's got to be the only one who was ever coach of the year and was not brought back the next year. It's you might be right on that. You may be right gotta, on that. It's got to be the only one that was coach of the year and not brought back. But he's one of the greatest people in this business, man. And uh, I'm thankful for all those guys being in my life. And um Shout out back to my father. I don't think those guys would be in my life if I wasn't the person, uh, you know, who my father groomed to be. So I'm thankful for all those guys being in my life. Yeah, I just want to say, man, like those, those, like those, those are some powerful names, and I'm fortunate to know all of them. You yeah. know, yeah. like you said, like I don't think, you know, yeah, what Curtis did, he did, but like I don't think, like you said, the lives that he changed, man. Not, not just, like you just said, not DeMar, not Mike. No, not forget those. I mean, there's so many other guys that is unbelievable. Like, you know, I, I saw the other day he went to go visit Joe Hampton. You know, like people don't, that, that stuff they don't, he they never don't, gave up on any they, of those. Guys. You know what I'm saying? Know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't. So I, I always like, yeah, you know, he's always had my respect from when I first started, you know, coaching high school basketball, like, and never, never has changed, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I talked to him recently, but like, yeah, he's, he's a guy you just don't, like I said, he's done so much for it, yeah. you know, before it's all over, people will be giving us flowers for what he did for, <laughs> for, for so many other, for so many, not just kids, but people, you know what I'm saying? So, for sure. um, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your young self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Um, network. <laughs> Network. So uh, you hit it on a, at the time. I'm not real good at the self-promotion. I've always known myself, even as a basketball player coming up, man, do your work. And you tell your kids this, right? Like, do the work. Don't talk about it. Just be about it. Do the work. Let your work show. So I took that into the coaching business as well. Instead of during my high school years, being able to network and this, that, and the third. And sometimes you look at it as self-promotion. But also it has another, you know, another thing to it where you can actually uh, learn from other people and, and other than, you know, not just real be stagnant with, with your work. If you're not branching out and all that, you can't really learn as much as you want to or make the connections you, you want to. So I've made, I, I would say the my fourth and fifth year of high school and my three years here, I make a ton of more connections and been a lot more open to, to people. But at first, man, I was all about, Hey, I'm a work. Um, it's me against the wall. I'm going to develop these kids that you think is not good. And we're we going to go out there and rock and it's us against the world. And uh, you can't really be like that in this business, man. So ne definitely network would be something I would tell my younger self. 
And that's a powerful word. That's what people don't understand. Networking is key. Relationships key yeah. Yeah. in this business. Well, look, Chris, man, I want to thank you again for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Um, is there anything you want to leave with the viewers before we go? No, I, I think I just want more people. And I, first, I got to get some gear, but I want more people to kind of look out for the podcast, man, because I think it's imperative for younger guys to look at what they're getting into. And like you said, you, you asked some terrific questions about the game and about the process of, of our day to day. But also, uh, I think like what you're sacrificing and stuff like that, I think that's imperative for any young coach that's looking to get in this business, whether it's on the boy side or girl side, to really know what they're getting into. Um, uh, so I definitely encourage everybody to keep on with the podcast. I'm, I'm super proud of you, even though you're, you know, older than me and everything, man. I, I love what you're doing and any, any way I can help you or anybody else, man, um, that comes on this or wants to learn or that they, they, they want to reach out to me, please give them my number any way I can help. I appreciate that, man. Those are great words. And, and, uh, you know, like you, like you said, like, and I, and I'll say the same thing, like see where you were to see where you are. That's tremendous. I'm proud of you. I know that it's going to even be better for you going forward. And a lot of people can learn from you because you, you know, like young coach at 26, yeah. you know, you, you, now you are in college. Like, you like you, 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 you kind of, you did it. You're doing it the old school way. Yeah. <laughs> right. A lot of people didn't do that. Like now is, you know, I was a high school coach and I got into college. Yeah. It, it hasn't been that way recently. It's been, you know, who I got as a player, AU, like I, you know, get a job, but you, You've done it like, hey, I started with development. I started, then I got into coaching. Like Out the mud. I love it out the mud. Love there you it go. The there mud. you go. Well, look, I want to thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. Stay safe and see you next time. Appreciate you.